get out our Bibles and join the study of God's Word. You know, a conversation can lead to different things. You know, a conversation might lead you to finding out about a new restaurant that you might want to go visit. It might lead you to uh, a deep discussion about political things. You know, you get into certain situations, it's like you don't talk about religion or politics, right? Yeah. But those conversations can lead you there. Conversations can lead you to want to know more about something. Maybe someone got a, a good deal on something, you know, and you, you want to go find out about it. How do I get that? In the case of uh, Cadence, and I'll just use her as an example this morning, a conversation led to her obeying the gospel. And that's a wonderful thing. When we think that it is simply conversation that can lead people to the Word of God. This past week, we were uh, involved in conversation. I was involved with a conversation with somebody, and uh, and so there were some questions that came up. And I thought, well, that's yeah. These ideas that were going through my mind, I thought those are ideas that I think probably a lot of people, you know, have questions about. And so I want to address some of those things this morning. Uh, some of those questions, these are not maybe the exact questions that we talked about, but it was ideas that came to my mind as we were having this conversation. And it has to do with these questions about the gospel. And so this morning I want us to ask some very serious questions about the gospel and see where we can come to on those things. First of all, Here's a good question. Probably should have saved this one for last, but can people be saved without the gospel? Now, I know, you know, it, for most of us, it might be really easy to just go ahead and blurt out an answer on that. But let's, let's go through a couple of things, if you will, and, and look at some of these things. I'm going to go through these verses rather quickly. Uh, some of them I have up on the board, but some of them I'm going to turn to. But I'm not going to wait on you to get there. So you might need to write that down instead of uh, maybe turning your Bible. But we're going to go through several things. First of all, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And so God's power to save, according to this verse, is through the gospel. In Acts chapter 15, uh, whenever Paul is talking about uh, going and, and preaching to the Gentiles, he said, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by the, my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And so it, 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 the gospel needs to be preached, it needs to be communicated, and then it needs to believe, be believed because of that. The, the gospel is the gospel that calls uh, us to the glory of Christ. In uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, Paul says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God, from the beginning, chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel, for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so if we, if we want to have that glory that Christ has, then we must be called by the gospel. There again, you have to hear it. You have to believe it. And then the gospel is to be obeyed. In Romans chapter 10, verses 16 through 17, Paul says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And here he is talking about those who have heard the gospel but have not obeyed. We must obey the gospel in order for there to be salvation. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, 
Speaking of Jesus coming in flaming fire and taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, if one does not hear, believe, and obey the gospel, then that person cannot be saved. And so the question, can people be saved without the gospel, that ought to be pretty clear, shouldn't it? But what about those who have no opportunity, or no opportunity to hear the gospel? You know, when we think about uh, how the gospel progressed through the world and, uh, and, and we, we think about all of those people who, you know, Paul and the other apostles, they preached the gospel, did they not? They went about it preaching, and yet what we find is many people did not accept the gospel that was preached. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul says that the, the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. And yet what you find in the world today is you find whole societies, whole civilizations who know nothing about Christ. They know nothing about the gospel. Are you going to tell me then that those people are lost? That those people are going to go to hell because they have had no opportunity to hear the gospel? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, he says, This I charge our, this charge I commit to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwrecked. There are those who reject the gospel. Did they preach to the whole world? Yes, they did. But there were many at that time who rejected the gospel. And you know, it only takes one, one generation for that gospel message to be completely lost within a family, within a society. And so those who, whose parents and grandparents and forefathers rejected that gospel and they've never heard the gospel, it is hard for many to believe that God would condemn them to hell because they've never had the opportunity to hear it. And so that puts the burden upon us, does it not? To go out here and preach the gospel? Here's some questions to make you think about that. If, if they were saved without the gospel, now this is kind of an opposite way of looking at this, but if those people could be saved without the gospel, what does that mean about me being an evangelizer? You know, if I'm going to go out here and spread the gospel. Well, that would mean that I need to stop what I'm doing. I need to quit preaching the gospel. Because if those people are saved without the gospel, they're better off left alone. Because God will take care of them. If they are saved without the gospel, consider this. Why would the apostles write all that they did in the word of God if they were saved without the gospel? And so to answer that question, can people be saved without the gospel? The answer is no. You can't be saved without the gospel. And so there is a burden upon us to spread the gospel. Lord willing, we'll talk more about that this evening. But I want you to consider this, you who are here this morning. You must obey the gospel to be saved. Period. End of story. You have to do that. And so that means that you have to hear the gospel. That means that you have to believe in Christ. That means that you have to do all of those things that are prescribed for us to do. We must obey the gospel to be saved. Here's another question. Because <laughs> if you've got to obey the gospel, it's important, isn't it? What is the gospel? What is the gospel? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Here Paul is talking about the gospel that he preached. He's talking about the fact that that gospel is what saved those there in Corinth. And then he goes on to explain what that gospel is. What is gospel? When you think about that word, you think about, okay, you, we hear that word, it's talking about the Bible, but we don't really know what it is. It means good news. That's what gospel means. And so when we read that word in our Bibles, understand that that's what it's talking about. It's talking about the good news. Paul talks about that good news in this verse. He talks about Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins and then being raised from that grave to walk a new life. He talks about that. That's what the gospel is. That's what the good news is, is that we are saved because Jesus died and was buried and he rose again. But the gospel, I'm, I'm going to skip some of these verses if that's all right. It's talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. Romans chapter 6, and verse 17 says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed that form of doctrine. What is that form of doctrine? We're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul talks about in the first part of that chapter. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, he says, Do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? He says, Therefore, we are buried with him, just as Christ was buried, through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so as we obey that gospel, that's what we're doing. In the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we are baptized, we are obeying the gospel. But is, is that all there is to the gospel? And, you know, oftentimes that's what people think is once I do that initial act of obedience, then I'm fine. I don't have to worry about that. I'm a Christian now. I can live my life the way I want to live. But is that the truth? In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, Paul writes, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless, the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, notice, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. And so all of these things that Paul is preaching against, he's saying those things are against sound doctrine, but that sound doctrine comes from the glorious gospel of God. And so the gospel is not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but it also contains many of the teachings that we must learn from. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, we find that we must continue in that gospel. He says, beginning in 21, And you who were once alienated and enemies in, the, in your mind by wicked works, yet now he reconciled. And so he's talking about the fact that we are separated from God. We're alienated from him because of our sin, because of our wickedness. But we have been reconciled to him. How did that happen? Verse 22, In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And notice that first word of verse 23, if. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, became a minister. 
We must continue in that gospel. If we don't continue in that gospel, we are moved away from it. We are alienated again from God. And so we must continue in those things that has been given to us. In Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul talks about the fact that we, we don't need to turn from that gospel that was preached. He says, beginning in verse 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another But there are some who would trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. They want to twist it. They want to change it. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to him, to you, uh, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And so he talks about the fact that we can't change this gospel. And so this gospel that we are to live by, this gospel that we are to continue in on our lives, it is set in stone. It is already laid out for us. And so anything that anyone else would try to to bring in there to change that, those things would be error. Those things would be incorrect. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, speaking of Christ... And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And so we must obey Christ. And so these things tell us and help us to understand that the gospel is not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but it's all the words of Christ. It is all the things that Christ told us to do. And those words come to us through the words of the New Testament. Those things that were written down by those inspired men. So you think of it like this way. If we're going to be a citizen of the United States, a free citizen, then we must obey the laws of this country. If I decide to take one of those laws and say, that's ridiculous, I'm not going to live by that law, I'm going to go against that, what is going to happen to me? Well, I'm going to be held accountable to that law in some way. You know, whatever it is, if I murder someone, what's going to happen to me? Well, I'm going to be put in jail for that. I'm going to be be punished for that. And so because of that, then I need to understand it is all the laws of the gospel that I must obey. It is all of the teachings of the New Testament that I must obey. It is all the gospel. So the answer to the question, what is the gospel? Well, it's all the New Testament. And we must obey all the gospel in order to be saved. Here's the third question. What will happen if I don't obey the gospel? Turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now you can turn to these. That's the only two I got left right there. 2 Thessalonians 1. It says, And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we learn from those verses that the Lord is going to take vengeance on those who do not obey his gospel. But notice what the result of that is, verses 9 and 10. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. Punishment. The punishment that we would receive from not obeying the gospel is everlasting. It's everlasting. He uses the word in in my English Bible, it says destruction here. 
And whenever we think of destruction, you know, you, you, you've seen videos, maybe you've seen it in person where, you know, people are demolishing a building. You know, you got that big wrecking ball, you know, and it hits that building and hits that building and crushes it and pulverizes the concrete and the, the wood and all those things. That's destruction in my mind. But there comes a point where there can't be any more destruction because it's completely destroyed. That's not the way it is with our punishment. Our punishment will be an everlasting destruction. We will be being destroyed eternally. The punishment also, as he mentions here, the punishment will be separation from the Lord. Separation from the glory of his power. So not only will we suffer punishment in, in everlasting destruction, we'll also suffer that separation from our Lord, our Creator. What will happen to those who stop obeying? You don't see this in the English Bible. It's difficult to discern this uh, from time to time because the Greek tenses are different from English tenses. But if you'll notice with me in verse 8, he says, all right, so Jesus is going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the tense that is used for obey there, and I know this is fancy talk, but it's, it's a present active participle, okay? And what that tells us is that is something that is an ongoing thing. And so you might even say it, he's going to take vengeance on those who are not obeying the gospel. And so what that tells us is that we must continue obeying the gospel. We must always live in obedience to that gospel. The Christian who does not continue to obey is going to suffer this punishment that Paul is talking about in this passage. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. I think it is interesting how Peter puts this. Uh, speaking, he's not speaking of Christians directly. He is speaking of those who are not believers. But I want you to notice how he puts this, beginning in verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, who is the us? He's talking about Christians. If judgment begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So he's talking about Christians, and he's talking about the fact that God is going to bring judgment upon Christians. He is going to judge us, us who are believers, us who have obeyed the gospel. He's going to judge us as to whether we have continued in that faith. If he's going to judge us that way, how much more is he going to judge those who have never obeyed the gospel? He goes on to say in verse 19, therefore... Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to the faithful creator. The good that he's talking about us doing there is not strictly doing good to one another, but doing all the good that God has commanded us to do in this life. All of the things that God has told us through his word, through the words of the New Testament, those are the things we are to live by in this life. That is good. Everything God has given us, we're supposed to do that. So what will happen if I don't continue to obey the gospel? Well, the answer is everlasting destruction. A lot of times we find in our society that we like to talk about heaven an awful lot. And I do. 
I like to talk about heaven. Because I don't know about you, but I'd like to be there someday. That's where I want to go. And we shy away from the subject of what the alternative is. The alternative is a hell. It is a hell full of punishment and torment and destruction. At times it is described as a lake of fire. It is called a burning furnace. It's called everlasting punishment. That is what is in store for us, you and me, if we don't continue to obey the gospel. The gospel is for all of us. Whether we are Christians or not, we are to obey the gospel. It is for those who have never heard it. And brethren, we need to be out here telling people about the gospel. We need to be out here spreading that word. But it's for them. It is for those who want to know what to do to be saved. And I am so thankful for those who who have that desire, who want to seek for it and learn what the gospel says so that they can do that and they can be saved. And the gospel is for us because we must continue to obey that gospel. It is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. It is in that word that he has given us. My question for you, what will you do with that gospel? What will you do with it? If you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, you have the opportunity to put the Lord on in baptism. Hear the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. I find it interesting, I didn't make this point earlier when I read 16 and 17. What Paul is doing is he is equating obedience with faith. They go hand in hand. You cannot separate the two. But you've got to hear the word first. You've got to believe that word. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. You've got to repent of your sins. That is to change your mind about it. And that change of mind will lead to a change of action. You are to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is the Son of God. He is the one who has all authority and all power. And then you're to be baptized, buried with him in that watery grave, to rise up as a new creature, a new creation in Christ. This morning, if you are not a child of God, We are willing to help you with that. If you need to study more about that, we are more than willing to sit down and study with you about what the Word of God says about that. But then we must continue to be faithful in our lives. We must give our lives over to Christ and live our lives how He wants us to live those things. And we must do that until death. But if we'll do that, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, we will receive the crown of life. Are you here this morning as a Christian and need to return to him? Can we help you in that in any way? If there's any way we can help you this morning, please come forward while we stand, while we sing.